Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. Please be seated. Wow. Faith family, you got it going on. To get this many people on a Wednesday night. Where there's snow everywhere. And every reason to, be stay, to stay home. You got it going on. Proud of you for being here tonight. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. This is a great church. You already know that, right? And I love Pastors Mike and Pastor Barb. Just amazing people. Great leaders. Love Jesus. Great communicators of the word. And how many of you are blessed to have them as your pastors? Can we thank God for? Amen, amen. Uh, I've had the opportunity of uh, uh, just serving their vision as uh, a friend. You know, people call me different things, but just as a friend. Uh, and I just want the church to know that they're as committed to excellence Monday through Friday as they are on the weekend. Because how many of you know Monday through Friday is the engine room? The details. And I have just been so impressed with their heart to make sure that the church is served and served well. And for that, I'm thankful and for who you are and what you do. And I have two great friends here tonight that I want to introduce you to. Uh, Pastor uh, Webb Parson and Pastor Tom Gassinger, my old, old friends. They're much older than me, but I'm so glad that they are here. If you'll just wave to everybody. Yeah, they're both pastors in this great area. Now, some of you are looking at me saying, uh, who is that? He sounds familiar, looks familiar, seen him somewhere, seen him somewhere. Uh, you might have come to my gas station. <laughs> my Dunkin' Donuts. My Subway. My laundromat. You could have seen me just anywhere. <laughs> so you just need to know that my being here is very, very expensive. I mean, who's pumping gas right now? So I got to get back to work really, really quickly. But it's an, it really is an honor and privilege to, to be here tonight with you. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Mark chapter 5, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Mark chapter 5, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are uh, going home in the, in the evening from work or what have you, and uh, you just want to duck into the grocery store really, really quick and pick up a few items. You know, you know how we do that? How many of you remember when we used to go grocery shopping? And how many of you know you have not done that in years? We just duck in to get two days supply. Is that not what we do? So, so you're going home, you're in a hurry, you, you duck into the, into the grocery store just to pick up four or five items and you get yourself a, a shopping cart, a buggy. And, and you throw in your four or five items, you're in a hurry, you want to just get home and you come to that lane which says, express lane, 10 items or less. You're number two in line. There's somebody else with their buggy in front of you, and they have their buggy in front of you. You are behind them with your buggy. What are you doing right now? Counting what? In whose buggy? You all are very sick. And, and, and so, so you count and you come up at 12. And then... Uh, you just don't know what to do, what to say. But you feel like cussing them out. <laughs> so can I tell you how Christians cuss? <sighs> All that can be said. It's said right there. Because how many of you know that waiting is difficult? Waiting is, okay, okay. Stay in the grocery store with me. Stay in the grocery store with me. Do you ever do this? So now you've actually got your cart full of stuff and, and, and you've got your cart, there are four or five lanes open and uh, you're looking for, uh, for which lane to go into and our minds do a quick calculus. We look at the checkout clerk. Mm. Then you look at the people in line. Mm, looks like they're going to take a minute here. Don't you all do that whole calculus thing there? And then here's a kicker. So you choose a line. 
But when you choose, you get into this line and you see that other person in that line. About the same place. Do you all do the same thing? I want to see hands on that one. I want to see hands on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you, if they make it out before you, it's just a bad day. But if you make it out before them, there's a God. <laughs> because waiting is difficult. In Mark chapter 5 is a story. Yeah, we're going to start reading it, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by a ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, one cometh out of the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands upon her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. And she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the presence that who touched my clothes. And his disciples said unto him, Thou see the multitude thronging thee, and says, Thou who touched me. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spake, there came from the rule of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why trouble the master any more? And soon Jesus heard the word that was spoken. He said unto the rule of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he come into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and see the tumult in them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make it as a do and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleep it. And they laughed him to scorn. And when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered into where the damsel was laying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. So here's the story. Jesus is, comes off the boat. There's this man, his name is Jairus. He's the chief operating officer of the temple. He's the administrator of the temple. So he comes to Jesus and says, hey, I got, got a daughter. She's 12 years of age. She's at home. She's very sick. She's about to die. Will you come to my house and heal her? Jesus says, no problem. I'm on my way. So Jairus and Jesus start walking towards Jairus' house. As Jairus is going, word gets out that Jesus is in town. So a mob starts forming. And Jesus is slowed down. What do you think Jairus is feeling right now? Kind of, come on, come on. This is my party. But as he's going further, the mob comes to a place where Jesus almost stopped and there's a woman there. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She reaches out, as we saw, the, his uh, clothes, touches his clothes and she's immediately healed. Now Jesus starts talking to this woman. In fact, let me tell you what this woman was like. Verse 33 tells us that she told him everything. You know people like that? <laughs> you ask them, how are you doing? Three hours later. Mm -hmm. So she told him everything. She is kneeling, Jesus is standing, they're talking to each other. And as they're talking to each other, there's messengers come from Jairus' house and say to Jairus, hey, your 12-year-old baby just died. What's Jairus feeling now? Glad you got healed, woman. Praise the Lord. But thanks to your healing, my baby just died. You bumped the line. I was in line first. And now thanks to you, 
my baby is dead. What do you do when you are waiting on your miracle? What do you do when you see the promises of God ahead of you? Almost in your grasp. Almost there. And yet like jello, it slips your grasp. Tonight I just want to spend a little time with you talking to you about what to do while waiting on your miracle. Anybody in here waiting on a miracle from the Lord? I want to tell you come to the right place tonight. Because what you do while waiting on a miracle will define if your miracle ever comes through. So we know the rest of the story. Jesus goes on to the house and raises that girl. But not only is that a story of Jesus going to JR's house and raising his daughter, it's really a story of two dying women. It starts with a woman who is hemorrhaging, ends with a young lady who is resurrected from the dead. It's a story of contrasts. How old was this girl? 12 years of age. How long has this woman been hemorrhaging? 12 years. This woman has been sick as long as this girl has been alive. This, this girl is an insider. This woman is an outsider. In fact, according to the law of Moses, according to the law of Moses, this woman was not allowed inside the temple. This girl lived in the temple. This woman was not allowed. See that the difference between not going to church and not being allowed to go to church. See the difference there? There's somebody saying, no, you can't come in. So for 12 years, she's been an outsider. This girl has been coddled and loved and embraced. But for 12 years, again, according to the law of Moses, anybody who touched her became unclean themselves. So for 12 years, nobody has touched her on purpose. She was somebody, somebody. She was somebody's mother, somebody's wife, somebody's aunt, somebody's cousin. She was somebody, somebody. But for 12 years, she hasn't felt human touch. So when she comes to Jesus, it's much more than, oh, she was hemorrhaging for 12 years and Jesus healed her of that. Oh no, by the time she came to Jesus, she was an outcast by the religion of that time. Emotionally, she was wrecked because nobody had touched her on purpose. Neither could she touch anybody on purpose. And the Bible tells us she was financially wrecked as well. <laughs> she spent all her money on HMO deductibles. Read your Bible, it's all in there. <laughs> tells, us, <laughs> tells us that she went from doctor to doctor and she could not get any better. So by the time she comes to Jesus, it's much more than just a physical healing. You're talking about a lady who is emotionally, financially, relationally, and yes, even spiritually. Because in those days, the only way to get a connection with God was to go to the temple. You know, now you can, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, have direct communication with him. In those days, the priest did not pray for you. You had no hope. So she comes in that moment of her life. This woman's healing took place in public. This girl's resurrection took place in private. This, this woman came to Jesus with her own faith. But this girl was dead. She didn't have a faith of her own. So her mama and daddy had to have faith for her. How many of you know there are times in your life when you're going through some stuff in your life and it's hard to muster up the faith that you need for yourself? And it is in that moment that you find out there are other people who can have faith for you. Aren't you glad you come to a great church, faith family, where you're not by yourself, you're not going through life by yourself, but when you are down and you cannot reach up and touch bottom, there's somebody here who will lift up your hands, somebody here who will encourage you, somebody here who will pray with you, somebody here who will keep up with you. Aren't you glad that you're in a wonderful church? And it's in the middle of all of that 
that I want to give you with that context six principles of what to do while waiting on your miracle. I know you're saying six principles. I've got three hours. I should be able to cover all that. Mm-hmm. Six principles. Principle number one is found in verse 36. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he says unto the ruler of the synagogue, principle number one is, don't be afraid. Principle number one is what? One is what? Don't be afraid. Now, get the scene now, get the scene. Look at me just for a moment, get the scene, get the scene. Woman is kneeling, Jesus is sending. Jairus is breathing on his neck. That's what I would do. I'd be pulling on Jesus' toga, skinny jeans, whatever he had on. <laughs> because Jairus knows, I gotta get Jesus to the house. Because he's already told Jesus earlier on, she's almost dead. Talking about his daughter. So Jesus is standing. He's talking to this woman. Jairus is right here. Jesus is talking to the woman, but overhears this conversation. He overhears the conversation that your baby just died. Now, Jesus could have looked at Jairus and said to him, it's all cool. Chill. I'm with you. I got this. This is what I do for a living. I raise people from the dead. It's all good. I've done this before. It all works out. I had another friend, Lazarus. He'd been dead for four days. I mean, this is a matter of hours. I, I got this. Just relax. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus looks on his face and he sees fear. Isn't that what happens to us? You go to the doctor and he says, hmm, I think we need to send it off for biopsy. Fear. HR calls you in. Human resources said, can we see you at two o'clock? Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? Why can't we think, oh, that's the promotion. No, 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 no. Immediately fear. And Jesus looks on Jairus' face and principle number one is Jesus looks at him, does not say to him, I got this, does not say to him, I'll resurrect your daughter, does not make him any promises, but looks on his face and says to him, don't be afraid. I'm here to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that you'll either live your life by faith or by fear. Don't be afraid. Because you see what happens is, as soon as fear grips your life. It's hard to believe God for the impossible. Because now we are focused on what could go wrong rather than what could go right. Uh, we start looking at the immensity of our problems rather than the immensity of our God. Instead of going to God, you know, we go to God and say, God, you know how big my problem is? Rather than going to our problem and saying, how big my God is. You see, once you come to a place in your life that doesn't matter what happens, I will not be afraid. Don't be afraid. But principle number two is right behind that. Principle number two is right behind that. Still in verse 36. Only believe. Only believe. So principle number one was what? Number two is? Only believe. Now you see that the difference between believing and only believing. Uh, when, when, when Jairus met Jesus, his daughter was not dead. She was just sick. So he could believe. But when she's dead, you got to only believe. <laughs> because when she was sick, he could have taken her to the regular doctor, to a homeopathic, herbologist, Holistic, aquapuncture, chiropractor, might move to Colorado. <laughs> it's legal there. I'm thinking of starting a church over there myself. You know how, how you all had these smoke machines and stuff like that? If a server starts dying, they throw some stuff in there. Everybody gets happy all over again. Whew. 
we had a good story. Ooh, I'm happy, happy, happy. So when, when she was sick, he had options. But now, he's out of options. Have you lived long enough to say, Sam, I've been there those places in my life where it seems like mama can't help me, daddy can't help me, the attorney can't help me, the doctor can't help me, the banker can't help me, the government can't help me, nobody can help me. And that's when we say, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help, my help, my help, my help, my help comes from the, it's from the Lord. You see, it's not like Jesus is one of the options. Again and again, I found in my life, he'll bring you to places in life where you have to, you stop believing and you only believe. But then there's principle number three. Found in verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Principle number three is surround yourself with positive people. Principle number three is what? Surround yourself with positive people. I'm here to tell you, when you're going through a trial in your life, you need to be around people who know how to pray. You need to even be around people who actually believe he's the same yesterday, today, and for ever. You need to be around people who actually believe that the Bible says what it means and it means what it says. You need to be around people who still believe that God is still a healer of people who are sick in their bodies. You need to be around people who know that in the middle of a financial distress for my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When you go through a tough time in your life, you got to know that I need to be around people who really believe God, who can lift up my hand who can pray with me, who can support me, who can encourage me, who will not bring me down, but take me to the throne room of Jesus. They'll say, I've been praying for you. How are you doing today? You need people who are positive. Surround yourself with what? Positive people. So before I go on, let me review with you if you remember the three principles so far. Number one is what? Don't be afraid. Number two? And number three? My favorite is number four. This is my favorite, absolute favorite. Verse 38. And he come into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and see the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he says to, the, to them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damned are not dead, but sleepeth. Verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. Here comes the principle. And when he had put them all out. Principle number Four is kick out the negative people from your life. Mm -hmm. Can I get an amen on that? Kick out the what? Negative people from your life. Wee, 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 wee. Don't you ever feel like just walking with some people and slapping them? In Jesus' name. Negative people. Always unhappy. Nothing goes their way. They always got the doldrum. Nothing, nothing. They, they're always about, you know, my mama had the same thing and she died. <laughs> oh, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, looks like the headlights of a train coming down. <laughs> Never, ever happy. Uh. So, I have a... Phone in my hand here, phone in my hand. You know, some of you don't have discernment to know who is negative. You don't even have the gift of suspicion. <laughs> That's cheaper, you can get that. You absolutely can get that. <laughs> so God's been working with the phone company, he really has. So, so when, a call is coming in, it tells you who's calling in. We call it what? Caller ID. But some of you can't even read. <laughs> so God worked with the, with the phone people and he put two buttons on it. A green button and a... May I highly recommend the red button? 
ignore, ignore, ignore. In some cases, you gotta hold it down because you feel better. <laughs> Kick out the negative people from your life. They haven't gone anywhere, they don't want you to go anywhere. They have no ambition. And they mock your ambition. They have no vision. They don't want to hear about vision. Doesn't matter how good and big it is, they're always going to rain on your parade. They're just wet blankets. What else can I call them in church? <laughs> and still be clean. You know how, I mean, they're sitting on the front row here. Might have a remote control, I don't know. I might go away and never be seen again. <laughs> I mean, these are just, can, can I, let me just break it down for you. If you want to be an eagle, stop hanging around turkeys. <laughs> because doesn't matter how good the turkey is, it's going to end up butterball somewhere. Kick out the negative people. Now, if you're married to one, that's a decision you made. But Sunday, pastor's going to talk about how to be an eagle while married to a turkey. That's a good sermon title right there. <laughs> I have found out, I have found out, I have found out that negative people just the presence in the room. Okay, think about Thanksgiving. Think about Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. You had him come to your dinner too, didn't you? You were having a wonderful time till Uncle Joe pulled up. And there can be 25 of you in the room, but that one walks in, bad attitude. You know, bad attitude. Bad, bad attitudes are like bad breath. Everybody else knows it. Except you. <laughs> and I don't know what's about us that we feel like we have this great sense to, we got to humor the people, the bad attitude. Are you okay? Pray for me. The devil is after me. Well, just run faster, do something. <laughs> People coming to your mind right now, aren't they? <laughs> Some of you can't laugh because you're sitting next to one. I understand that. I'll move off this point. I'll move off this point. But I want you to know, this is my best point. Do what? Kick out the negative people from your life. Even Jesus knew he couldn't do a miracle till he, till he got those people out of the room. Principle number five. Principle number five. Verse 41. Verse 41. And he took the damsel by the hand, said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted. Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Principle number five is speak life to your situation. Speak what? Life. Speak. Life. Speak. Life. Anybody can speak death. Oh, I don't know if that's going to work out or not. Oh, the religious people, they just killed me. Have you prayed about it? That is their way of saying I think you're stupid. <laughs> Anybody can speak death, but somebody in here needs to speak life. Oh, when you're going through a tough time in your physical body, speak life. When you're going through a tough time in your finances, speak life. Life. When you're going to tough time in your job, speak life. If you're having marital discord, speak life. Doesn't matter what you're going through in life, make up your mind. From this day on, you will speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Speak life. But then, principle number six. Found in verse 42 and 43. Oh, before I do that, let me review real quickly over here. You all can cheat right now. At the end of the service, I'm going to give you a test with no notes allowed. Uh -huh. I'm looking at the front row right there. I got it, I got it. Okay, principle number one is what? Number two? Number three? Ah, 
And number four. Did you see how the octane goes up in the room? Because all of you have a list. And principle number five is speak life. Here we go. Verse 42 and 43. Good class. You are just amazing class. Much different from what Pastor Mike and Pastor Bob told me. <laughs> Verse 42 to 43. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. You know, by now you can't take anything I say seriously. But I'll keep plodding away. I've got 16 more minutes left. Verse 42, 43. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. Here comes the principle. Verse 43. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. And commanded that something should be given her to eat. Principle number six is feed your miracle. You got to do what? Feed your miracle. Feed your miracle. Feed your miracle. I grew up in a spiritual church. My, in India, my father was the pastor. So I've been around church folk, especially spiritual church folk. We love talking about our miracles. We like to testify about our miracles. We like to write songs about our miracles. Once in a while, we get happy, even clap about our miracle. We like to give an extra offering because of a miracle. But that's not feeding your miracle. That's just talking about it. Because when you feed your miracle, it's a totally different thing. I got two daughters. I got two daughters. Rachel's 35, Debbie's 33. I used to pastor a church in Michigan when both of the babies were born. So when I landed today in, at your airport, saw all the white stuff, it reminded me why I moved to Atlanta. <laughs> Looks beautiful from over there till you have to live in there. So St. Joe, Michigan, Rachel was born. Rachel was born. It was a surreal experience when your first baby is born. Anybody remember your first baby being born? I mean, it is just like, I don't know. Rachel was born ugly. <laughs> when I went to those birthing classes with my wife, Brenda, they were, did not prepare me for what they were handing to me. <laughs> Slippery, slimy, <laughs> blotchy. Her fists were already balled up. She's not even a teenager yet. <laughs> and that stuff attached to her. Like, can you hose her down? <laughs> can you not clean her up and wrap her up like I've seen in the movies? <laughs> can I have some gloves? So they handed Rachel to me. October 20th, 1980. They handed Rachel to me. Surreal experience. I still remember sitting in that rocking chair. They had me all, you know, with that gown and my face and, you know, red and all that kind of stuff. And I'm rocking her. I'm going through this weird schizophrenic moment. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing. I'm crying. I'm smiling. I'm crying some more. I'm laying hands on her, praying over her, casting demons that are not even demons, <laughs> surrounding her with God's favor and building a hedge. Any prayer that I had heard, I was praying over her. She was a miracle, a miracle. I wonder what would have happened if I, at that time, was pastoring a church. I wonder what would have happened if I had brought Rachel to a church put her on the altar, got all of my elders and, you know, whoever leaders of the church, and got the praise team together, and we testified about Rachel, and we sang about Rachel, and we prayed about Rachel, but we never fed Rachel. What would happen to Rachel? Yeah. You know why Rachel is still alive? And has her own babies. Because I have fed her hundreds of thousands of dollars of groceries. <laughs> That's why she's alive. 
She's not alive because of prayer. <laughs> She's alive because I have fed her and I'm still feeding her. Yeah, adult children are like the tide. They go out, come back in, go out, come back in, go out, come back in, go out. I'm saving a thousand dollars. She never cooks at home. She thinks we are the cafeteria. <laughs> Feeding a miracle. So what we do is, if we just talk about it, it's like going to a museum. You go into a museum, and how many of you know nothing moves in a museum? If something moves, <laughs> may I suggest getting out of there? If that lion in that museum goes, I'm going to make a suggestion. Move out of there. Because that's what we do in church. Oh, that is when huh, our house burned down, but God was so good to us. Oh, that's where I lost my job, but God still supplied our needs. Oh, that is where we almost went through a divorce, but God put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And, and oh, 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 over there, over there, you know, we're just going through a real difficult time. And, and God, that's just talking about your miracle. Can I tell you what feeding a miracle means? If you needed some extra cash and God brought somebody in your life who gave you extra cash, don't just sing about it. Don't just testify about it. Find somebody else who needs some extra cash and give them the extra cash. Now you're doing what you are, feeding your miracle. You're looking for a job and God gave you a job. Don't just talk about it, Facebook about it, and Twitter about it, Instagram about it. All that is cool and wonderful. But the way you feed your miracle is to find somebody who does not have a job, looking for a job, and help them find a job. Now you are feeding your miracle. If you went to the hospital and God brought you out on a return ticket, you know some people go on a one-way ticket. Go and never come back out. You came back out. We are glad that you're out. We rejoice, we celebrate, we're happy. Please know that we are just ecstatic that God brought you out. But that's not feeding your miracle. Feeding a miracle means when you find out somebody from your family, from the faith family, is in a hospital somewhere, don't wait for somebody from pastoral care to go and see them. Get yourself in a car, go up and down that hallway yourself, walk into a room, pray with somebody, say to them, I was here, God brought me out, and he's going to bring you out as well. I'm talking about feeding your miracle. Because when you feed your miracle... You multiply your own miracle. So just like Rachel. She has her own babies now. You know why she has her own babies now? Because daddy fed her. And so your miracle multiplies. Not just dies with you. If your marriage was going through a tough time. And God put you back together. Through good counsel, through good prayer, through great teaching at a church like this. That's great and wonderful. But how about finding somebody else who's going through a trial and tribulation in their marriage and helping them put their lives back together? Because that is what is known as feeding your miracle. Jairus, I'm coming to your house. But you got to learn a few things. Number one is what? Don't be afraid. Number two is? Number three is? Number four is? Uh huh. Number five is speak. 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 And number six is once God blesses you, don't hoard it. Don't just talk about it. Don't keep it to yourself. But if you want to multiply your blessing, if you want to multiply your miracle, if you want other miracles to come out of that one miracle, you've got to do what you got to feed your miracle. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you're still a miracle-working God and that... You made us a promise that you're coming to our house and we want to hold on to that promise. Lord, in a moment, there'll be sisters and brothers who'll be responding to this word. And I pray, Lord, that you will do what you've always done. Meet us at a point of need and we'll thank you for it. 
in Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. Everyone standing, everyone standing, everyone standing.